Income tax 2021-2022 business income part number seven. Get ready to get refunds to the max diving into income tax 2021-2022. Most of this information can be found in Publication 334, Tax Guide for Small Business Tax Year 2021, Income Tax Formula, Line 1, Income, which would be supplemented by another schedule, basically an income statement, income and expenses included in it. Expenses basically being deductions, the net then rolling in to Line 1, Income of the Income Tax Formula, and Page 1 of the 1040, which we see here, Schedule C, in essence, rolling into Schedule 1, in essence, since rolling into the page one form 1040 line eight here this is the schedule c profit or loss from the business basically an income statement we're still focused on the income line so items that are not income so we've spent a lot of time talking about items that are income and these would be the items that the iris is going to specifically list that are not income and note that if it's not income that's usually good for taxes incomes good normally in life but taxes flips everything on their head so if we don't have to include it in income that would be a good thing because then we don't have to give the irs their share of it so in some cases the property or money you receive is not income let's take a look at those cases appreciation so increase in value of your property are not income until you realize the increase through a sale or other taxable disposition so if you have property and basically the property goes up in value we don't typically have to record that as income even though we might say that our net worth has basically increased generally but rather we wait till we sell the item in order to record the income so you might see this for example on the depreciable type of property like equipment and so on that it, it could actually go up in value or possibly like real estate a building or something like that may actually increase in value we would hope that it would over time but we wouldn't record that increase in value on the taxes and have to pay taxes on that increase until we actually sold the item the rationale kind of being that for most things we don't really know if they've increased in value for sure because the things are unique in the world like a building is unique you can kind of compare it to other buildings but it's not really the same thing it's not in the same location it's not built exactly the same way uh, even though they could be quite similar in some cases so it's really difficult to know and then of course the market could go up and down based on any other kind of circumstances so you haven't really locked in the gain until it happens that we have what we call realize the gain when the sale takes place that's also by the way part of the just justification for having a lower capital gains rate than ordinary income rates because you'll recall that we have a progressive tax system which means that if you have more income in a particular year then you, you might be taxed at higher rates than if your income was lower and you can imagine that if you had like a building for example that you've been working in or whatever it's your office building or something like that and you hold you held on to it for the last 20 years and it increased in value substantially and then you sold it that one sale could result in a whole lot of income in one year when in actuality the income had really been earned over the last 20 years but because it's in one year that's going to jump you up into a really lot higher tax bracket than if you had spread out the income over the 20 years which is one of the justifications for like lower capital gains rates rather than having everything in order to income rates but I digress that you can get into that argument further if you if you want to so we got consignments consignments of merchandise to others to sell for you are not sales so we might say that we're gonna we're gonna have consignments are a little bit confusing because basically the owner of the person that's like owning the inventory or the person that's actually selling the inventory is not basically the owner so for example if I was a painter for example and I I wanted to take my artwork and hang it up in local places like restaurants or something like that on consignment then the restaurants actually have the inventory but they they don't really own the inventory it's still the painter my inventory and they're going to facilitate the sale if anybody wants to buy them from from their from their area so consignment of merchandise to others to sell for you are not sales so when we put the our paintings in the restaurant it's not a sale taking place it's a consignment the title of the merchandise remains with you the consignor even after the consignee possesses the merchandise therefore if the sh if the ship goods 
on consignment, you have no profit or loss until the consignee sells the merchandise. Merchandise you have shipped out on consignment is included in your inventory. So the paintings would be in someone else's place and their restaurant in that case, but they'd still be on my books as the inventory until they sold it, at which point we would recognize the sale. Do not include merchandise you receive on consignment in your inventory. Include your profit or commission on merchandise consigned to you in your income when you sell the merchandise or when you receive your profits or commission depending upon method of accounting you use. Construction allowances. If you enter into a lease after August 5th, 1997, you can exclude from income the construction allowance you receive in cash or as rent reduction from your landlord if you receive it under both of the following conditions. Under a short-term lease of retail space, for the purpose of constructing or improving qualified long-term real property for use uh, for use in your business at that retail space. Amount you can exclude. So exclusions for income purposes, generally good thing. We want to exclude the income so that we don't have to include it and then don't pay taxes on it. You can exclude the construction allowance to the extent it does not exclude the amount you spent for construction or improvements short-term lease. A short-term lease is a lease or other agreement for, for occupancy or use of retail space for 15 years or less. The following rules apply uh, in determining whether the lease is for 15 years or less. Take into account options to renew when figuring whether the lease is for 15 years or less, but do not take into account any option to renew at fair market value determined at the time of the renewal. So we've got this kind of these nuances with the lease terms. Whenever you dive into lease terms, how are they structuring the lease? You know, do you, what's your renewal options can affect basically, you know, your options for renewing it. So it gets a little bit in the weeds there. But uh, two or more successive leases that are part of the same transaction or a series of related transactions. So you can imagine people trying to construct creative lease documents and you have these arguments of, about the reality of, of the term versus the structure of uh, the lease substance versus form arguments with regards to it's structured in one way, you know, but in really in reality, it's they they structured it that way to try to figure a way around something, for example. So for so once again, two or more successive leases that are part of the same transaction or a series of related transactions for the same or substantially similar retail space are treated as one lease. So then we have the retail space. Retail space is real property leased, occupied, or otherwise used by you as a tenant in your business of selling tangible personal property or services to the general public. Qualified long-term real property. Qualified long-term real property is non-residential real property basically real estate, non-residential, not homes, that is part of or otherwise present at your retail space and that reverts to the landlord when the lease ends. So obviously, again, that last part, it reverts to the landlord. If it didn't, it would basically be a purchase, right? That, that you would think, right? That's been set up kind of like a lease term. So exchange of like kind property. property. So generally, if you exchange real property, so now we're talking real property, generally like real estate, real property used for business or held as an investment solely for other business or investment real property of a like kind, no gain or loss is recognized. So you could do a lot more research on the like kind uh, type of exchange. Uh, but but basically, if it's a like kind exchange, then then you might you, you could kind of defer possibly part of the gain in that instance. And it used to be, by the way, something that was a bit more broad. So you'd apply it to, to other things. So mainly it's being applied to the real property at this point in time. So keep that in mind, real property being a little bit more confusing, given the fact that there's going to be multiple factors with regards to like real estate uh, properties with the mortgages and the and the property itself. So this means that the gain is not taxable and the loss is not deductible. For more information, you can see form 8824. So basically the, the kind of idea of it is, it is that if you were going to exchange the property, instead of recording it as a sale, if you sold the property and then you'd have to recognize a gain and then pay taxes on it and then buy the other property. The general idea would be that you're gonna say, okay, well, since you're kind of in the same spot because you're buying the same kind of property, 
then we don't want to force you to recognize a gain at this point in time. We would like to kind of defer that so we don't disincentivize that kind of transaction from taking place by recording taxes on it uh, at the point in time of an exchange kind of situation. So what you would think then, okay, well then when I, when I basically sell the property, then instead of recognizing the gain, I'm just going to purchase the new property and basically I put the new property on the books instead of at the current market price, you put the new property on the books at like the adjusted basis, which you would think would be lower because you've been recording possibly depreciation on the other property. So now you've got this lower basis. So you didn't, you didn't recognize the gain, but you'd have this lower basis that would be on the property. Why does that matter? Because when you sell the property, that lower basis is going to cause a greater gain that's going to be taking place. It'll also lower possible possibly the amount of depreciation you can take at that point. So basically you're deferring the gain. Now it gets more complicated than that. It gets quite complicated when you get into the situation of of the mortgages that are involved and then, you know, how exactly are you going to facilitate facilitate the like kind of exchange with the real estate and then you got escrow going into it. So it can get quite a complicated specialized kind of area, but that's, you know, the general idea. So leasehold improvements if a tenant er erects buildings or makes improvements to the property, the increase in the value of the property due to the improvements is not income to you. However, if the fact uh, indicate that the improvements are payment to of rent to you, then the increase would value would be income. So in other words, if they if your tenant is saying if your tenant saying I, I can do whatever I want to the property within the these areas and I make improvements to the property and it's on the tenant, the tenants just doing that because that's what they want to do with their place, then that might not be income. But if they say, hey, look, I'm gonna make this improvement for you and you're gonna lower the rent for me to do that, then it, then it would be you know, income. So loans, money borrowed through a bona fide loan is not income. So obviously if, if you took out a loan, that would be a balance sheet item, you would get money, but it's not gonna be income in that case. It would be a balance sheet item, not reported on the Schedule C because that's just the income statement. But if we imagine balance sheet accounts, you'd have a loan payable, uh, you would expect, which isn't an, you know, an income, therefore not on, the, not on the Schedule C, not taxable. Sales tax, state and local sales tax imposed on the buyer, which, uh, which you were required to collect and pay over to the state or local government are not income. So if you had to collect the sales tax and then pay it over, you might say you might record that two different ways. You might say, well, I'll record it as income and then have a deduction for the sales tax. Or you might just say, I'm not, it's not my sales tax that I'm paying and therefore I'm not gonna record it as income or have the deduction for the sales tax in that instance.